Good afternoon on this lovely spring day. Um, a couple of announcements. One is um, cell phones, please turn them off. Second is that there are some feedback forms on the table in the hall. They're a little early, but next week is our last lecture. And so if you pick up a feedback form, tuck it in a pocket, but remember to bring it back next week. And speaking of next week, the, you lovely people, privileged people who are members, get to come to our annual meeting. And if you have been a member in the 2017 fall semester or this spring semester, you are eligible to listen and vote at our annual meeting. So it starts at 1. You really don't want to miss it. What exciting things you will learn. And afterwards, we'll have some wonderful goodies. And then the speaker will come at 2. And now, Sandy, you will introduce the speaker. Thank you. And the speaker today is Ben Dongle, who is a professor at Sorry. The speaker today is Ben Dongle, who is a professor at Champlain. He is a journalist also and the editor of a, a magazine called Toward Freedom, which you can get if you actually talk to him, but he'll give you the source of that. Uh, ben is a specialist in Latin American studies. He's a reporter. He's the, uh, he has written many articles on Counterpunch and other uh, journals. He is a very active um, reporter on Latin American issues. He is one of the few people, I think, that would call himself an expert on Bolivia, and that's one of the reasons that I've asked him to be here, because he's lived there, and he knows much about Bolivia, but he also knows much about Latin America, which I think is a rather understudied part of our hemisphere. So this is Ben Dongle. As I mentioned, he is a professor at Champlain, and he has a whole pile of books, which are over there, correct? And available. Okay, thank you. Um, you can all hear me well? Yeah. One, two, three. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, Sandy, for introducing me. Thanks a lot for having me here. Um, as Sandy mentioned, I teach at Champlain College. I teach journalism there. And I live here in uh, Burlington. Well, we're in South Burlington now, but I live in, in Burlington proper. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, the leftist shift in Latin America that took place from roughly 2000 to 2012 in the halls of power as leftist presidents um, entered office. And then uh, more recently, the rightward trend in, um, in government around Latin America from pretty much 2012 onward. So to give a panorama of about six different countries, some key characteristics of each government and, and, um, and the protest movements operating there, and point us a few ways forward that I think will be um, that uh, point to a few uh, developments that may be happening in the next few years. So to start, um, uh, throughout the 1990s, before this leftist shift from Venezuela to Argentina, there was there, a lot of the governments throughout Latin America were under neoliberal presidents, uh, under governments that wanted to undermine workers' rights, that wanted to privatize natural resources and public services and worked um, against human rights and were working hard to insert their economies into the global corporate economy throughout the 1990s. And toward the end of the 1990s, you saw um, a rise of various protest movements that were against this in the streets, fighting for workers' rights, fighting for socialism, fighting for human rights and justice, um, in the sh following the shadows and the legacy of a lot of dictatorships that were in power throughout the Cold War in Latin America. And from Venezuela to Argentina, these groups uh, took to the streets and they defeated um, multinational corporations, um, multinational lending institutions, in a lot of very exciting and inspiring David and, and Goliath type of scenarios. So for example, in Bolivia, where Sandy mentioned I've spent a lot of time, um, there was this great 
iconic protest that took place in Cochabamba, the city of Cochabamba in central Bolivia in 2000. And it was against a plan uh, that was pushed by the World Bank to privatize that city's water. It was under public control. They wanted to privatize it in order to balance the budget. Um, people rose up against this plan because the, um, the World Bank was recommending that Bechtel, a, a huge multinational corporation, was going to take over the city's water and put everything from water cisterns to farmers' small irrigation networks under the thumb of this multinational corporation based in San Francisco. So, and the price was going to, the, the price for water um, was going to raise, rise dramatically for people across classes. So, in this country that a lot of people in the US had never even heard of, and during this period of economic um, neoliberalism across the globe and people cheerleading corporate globalization, there's this amazing story in 2000, in April of 2000, when these people in Bolivia rose up, protested, blockaded roads, went on strike, um, and pressured their government to the point where they actually kicked Bechtel out of the city and put the water back into public hands. So this is amazing, like, unprecedented story, especially in Bolivia. Um, and in Bolivia and in throughout the region during this time, there were a lot of similar uh, cases of such um, protest movements taking place. Um, in Argentina, at roughly the same time, there was an economic crisis in the country that um, uh, resulted in the crash of the economy and people went from having um, you know, their, their incomes, their savings, one day to having nothing the next day. And uh, I lived in the country, in Argentina during that time uh, as a student. And um, people were, this was at a time when Argentina was relatively stable, the economy was strong in the late 90s, early 2000s. And then all of a sudden, people uh, across um, economic divides were in the same boat, they had nothing. And they, again, in this place, took to the streets, protested. They went through, I think, six presidents in two weeks um, and uh, occupied, um, uh, when, when their factories and businesses went bankrupt, which many of them did, there was a stipulation in the Argentine constitution that said that if people, um, if, a, if a company went bankrupt and the owner fled the country, the workers could take control of the business. Uh, and form a cooperative, and a lot of people did. A lot of these workers did uh, literally occupy ceramic, um, textile factories, hotels, book publishing companies, um, and turn them into workers' cooperatives. So that was really another exciting um, example of this grassroots politics during this time. Um, in Chile, at the same time, you have a country that's grappling with the um, the shadow of the, of the Pinochet dictatorship. It's still, so we're talking early 2000s, uh, 2003 was the 40th anniversary of the coup against uh, socialist president Salvador Allende in Chile. And in that country um, where I was traveling also in 2003, right around this time of the anniversary, uh, there was still a great sense of fear and censor censorship and a surprising lack of awareness about what even took place um, under Pinochet in the country in 2003 at that time. So I'm talking about younger generations, people who hadn't necessarily lived through it. And I was coming to the country um, having read a few books about Pinochet and, and Allende, and I sometimes knew more simply because I lived in the US and were, was able to read um, books based on declassified government documents and watch some documentaries about this, but I went to Chile and I, and I was just really struck by um, the hold that the dictatorship's culture of censorship and silencing people still had. So in, in 2003, there was still this great, this, this awakening was still happening about how do we come to terms with the crimes of the dictatorship. There were some 3,000 people that were disappeared and murdered um, under the Pinochet dictatorship. How do we um, bring the criminals of this dictatorship to justice? And, um, and there were huge mobilizations around Santiago, the city, the capital city of the country, around this to demand, um, demand justice, awareness. They were, they were showing um, the Battle of Chile, which is uh, a great documentary about the Pinochet dictatorship on um, television. So there was this rising awareness of this, um, uh, of what actually went on under the dictatorship and a push for human rights. So that was in Chile. 
in Brazil at the same time, following this, um, uh, this regional kind of awakening and grassroots push, there was this group that became more and more powerful over this period called the Landless Workers Movement, the MST, in Brazil. And Brazil is a place with a huge amount of land, a huge amount of um, um, underutilized land, a, a huge amount of land that's, um, uh, that is owned by large landowners, cattle ranchers, cotton farmers, soy farmers. And meanwhile, you have a, you have a, a large number of small farming communities that don't have any land. They need, they need, need land to survive. So th what the MST did was say, well, we need land. Uh, we need, we want to work the land. There's all this land in Brazil. We want to take it over and, um, and, and own it for ourselves. So they operate under a slogan called Occupy, Resist, Produce. So they would take over land, resist the eviction of, of themselves from the land by the police and thugs and paramilitaries, and then start working the land. And also here, there's a, there's a, a part of the um, constitution in Brazil that I think was reformed in the 1980s that said that if there is underutilized land that isn't serving any social purpose, um, peasant farmers can take it over and actually work it. And, and it takes a lot of uh, legal work to actually gain the ownership, but under that slogan of Occupy, Resist, Produce, um, the Landless Workers Movement has settled hundreds of thousands of families on land across Brazil. So this was also happening in the streets, outside the halls of power during this period, and it was, um, it really helped pave the way to a lot of the leftist victories to come, the leftist electoral victories to come later on in the 2000s. So, um, from, uh, so these are some of the, these are some examples of grassroots movements, grassroots victories, but what was also so notable about this period from roughly 2000 to 2012, as I mentioned, was out of these struggles, presidents, political parties, electoral um, currents came to win power from Venezuela to Ecuador to Brazil to Chile and Argentina. So first, in um, Venezuela in 1999, uh, Hugo Chavez was elected president. And he was, was um, came from a poor background, uh, military background, and from the very beginning had a populist um, political vision that he wanted um, to, to, um, to govern towards. And a as his presidency evolved, um, by 2000, after they'd passed a new constitution, he, his government made a lot of very progressive changes in the country um, that helped redistribute political power around the country, redistribute economic wealth. And Venezuela is a huge oil producer, has a lot of crude oil. And, um, and what Chavez did was nationalize the oil industry in, in Venezuela and redistribute a lot of that oil wealth to poorer sectors of society and use the funds to start schools, start hospitals, start different uh, programs called missions where uh, literacy and um, occupational training um, programs were instituted around the country. And besides this type of redistribution of wealth and political power, he also, um, his government also helped institute programs like communal councils in neighborhoods where S neighborhoods had the power to organize their own budget, um, have more of a voice in local politics. And in a place like Venezuela, which, where the income inequality is so stark, this really empowered the poorest sectors of society to be part of government, um, uh, work out of generation, you know, multi-generational poverty. And he be Chavez became this kind of iconic, charismatic leader that a lot of Venezuelans came to um, really love and admire, and I'll get to how things have evolved since that period, but this was a major development in the early 2000s in terms of leftist victories in the, in the region. Um, at the same time that Chavez worked for a kind of socialist transformation of Venezuela, he also was importantly a leader of this uh, rising leftist bloc in the region where he said, he, he was a part of a group of presidents who said, we don't want to bow down to US military or political power. We don't want to bow down to the World Bank and the IMF. We want to form different organizations, different relationships among Latin American countries to build economic 
sovereignty and self-determination so that we can control our own militaries, our own economies, without just following what the U.S. tells us to do. So Chavez was a big part of that um, Latin American solidarity effort within Latin America. Can everybody hear me? Okay, let's get a little feedback, but that's all right. Okay, the, uh, okay cool. The, um, and then in Argentina, shortly following this economic crash, Nestor Kirchner was elected in 2003. Um, he helped bring Argentina back from its economic crisis by strengthening the welfare state, uh, building up a safety net for the poorest people in society, um, led, the fight, led the regional fight against the free trade area of the Americas, which was a plan by George Bush to extend NAFTA, North American Tre Free Trade Agreement, between um, Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, extend that all the way throughout Latin America. And so that was something that many presidents and Latin Americans looking at NAFTA said, we don't want that throughout Latin America. We reject this, and Kirchner really led the charge um, on, uh, with that resistance effort specifically against the Bush administration. Um, and Nestor Kirchner, as the president of Argentina, a very powerful country economically, um, his, his participation as well as Brazil's participation helped shut that plan down. So there is no FTAA, free trade area of the Americas. There are various bilateral agreements, but this was another major leftist victory to shut that plan to extend NAFTA down. So Nestor Kirchner um, made historic advances for justice for the crimes of the dictatorship in that country, which was roughly 1976 to 1983. Um, under the Videla regime, the military junta, um, and uh, raised the minimum wage, turned his back on the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, empowered unions, expanded Social Security, um, and he passed away in uh, 2007 and his wife ran for election and she was president until I believe uh, 2017. So she carried on many of the same policies, the same kind of political trajectory. Um, meanwhile, in other countries around the region, you have President Lula in Brazil, who comes from an uh, auto union struggle and uh, was the leader of the Workers' Party in Brazil. And he, as another quasi-socialist president, uh, it was a huge event when he was elected in 2003. Brazil is, is such a, a powerful country, a major world um, economy, and, um, and he led the country from 2003 to 2011 lifting millions out of poverty, uh, also redirected a lot of state funds toward um, programs to alleviate hunger, and uh, worked with unions and the landless uh, workers movement to work for a better land reform and worker empowerment in the country. Uh, Chilean President Michel Bachelet was president in the country, in Chile from um, 2006 to 2010, and then 2014 to 2018. Uh, some because of the laws in Chile where they don't allow presidents to run two consecutive terms. She had a break there. And she also, coming out of this, she was someone who was tortured under the Pinochet regime and fought against it, and she, coming out of this dictatorial legacy, her election was a huge accomplishment, political accomplishment for the Chilean left that was working for justice in Chile. Um, at the same time, you have the election of Rafael Correa in, our, in um, Ecuador in 2007, and he was another person who identified with Ch Hugo Chavez's style of politics, um, Nestor Kirchner's style of politics in Argentina, uh, in asserting um, Latin American sovereignty and saying, we don't want, for example, he said, we don't want the U.S. to have a military base in Ecuador, and he kicked out the U.S. military from uh, the base in Manta, Ecuador. He said, unless we can have a military base in Miami, we won't let you have a military base mm -hmm. in um, Ecuador. So he did that. He granted asylum to Julian Assange, the uh, person who started WikiLeaks um, early on, and that's where Julian Assange is still based in the Ecuadorian embassy. Well, that's kind of been a different, that story has evolved with <laughs> Assange, but back then it was like a huge symbol of where Correa stood on these issues. Um, and uh, um, many countries, in, including Venezuela and Ecuador at this time, also passed constitutions that were very progressive. And one of the elements of the constitution in Ecuador that was so exciting was that he passed, his government passed a bill, passed a constitution that respected the rights of nature. Um, 
and in Ecuador, where the big chunk of the Amazon is, though not as much as in Brazil, that was a huge um, that was a huge victory for environmentalists and indigenous communities in the country. Um, and meanwhile, in in uh, Paraguay, uh, Fernando Lugo, uh, bishop and practitioner of liberation theology in Paraguay, was elected. I think it was 2009, and he moved forward on important land reform in the country. Also pro helped to prosecute um, people involved in the dictatorship in that country. And Pepe Mujica in Uruguay was elected um, uh, on the Frente Amplio party. And he was um, also somebody who was tortured under the dictatorship in Uruguay, worked toward justice in his country. He, he was, he was uh, called the poorest president in the world because he refused to accept a lot of his salary and just lived, had a beat up um, VW bug that he, and a motor, and a, like a moped that he rode around and <laughs> was a very humble guy. And um, he just left office, but, uh, so they were all working together, a lot of these presidents. And, um, and then last but not least, Evo Morales was elected in Bolivia in 2005. And Evo is a, um, is an indigenous Aymara man, a former coca grower. Uh, coca in Bolivia is used for medicinal purposes um, and cultural purposes. It's, uh, it's also a key ingredient in cocaine, so it's the focus of a lot of uh, drug, anti-drug efforts. But in Bolivia, uh, coca goes to a legal market where a lot of people um, buy coca to chew it with, uh, in the mines. Um, Bolivia is a huge mining country. Um, and it's kind of like the equivalent of having a cup of coffee and taking an aspirin or something. And people, people chew it, drink it in tea, and it's used in, in different Andean uh, indigenous ceremonies. So the, um, the leaf went to this legal market. Evo Morales came out of that sector, that peasant production sector, as well as that uh, coca growers movement, which resisted the US militarization of coca growing areas uh, in the war on drugs for so many years the U.S. and Bolivia focused their efforts on the violent eradication of coca crops. Um, and Evo said, we don't believe, Evo Morales said, we don't believe in the production of cocaine. We want to stop the production of cocaine, but we have the right to grow coca for this legal market in peace. And so he uh, arose out of that anti-U.S. -milit militarization movement. And out of that movement grew the movement towards socialism, the MAS, M-A-S. Uh, talking about in the 1990s, early 2000s, and then in 2005, Evo Morales uh, was elected president of Bolivia. So this was a huge event for a country that had such um, a divide between uh, where, where the, the vast majority of indigenous people in the country were living in poverty, and the fact that Evo Morales could be elected president um, as an indigenous Aymara man was a huge uh, watershed moment in the country. And he helped, um, he, he was a part of this regional shift, and, and he did a lot of exciting things, including nationalize the country's natural gas reserves to redirect that wealth and income toward, the, uh, um, toward alleviating, poverty, uh, alleviating poverty in the country and, and uh, extending access to education and health care to the country's poor majority. Um, he oversaw a new constitution, the rewriting of the constitution in a constituent assembly so that the constitution was... Uh, very, the new constitution was very progressive. Um, he kicked out the drug enforcement agency in Bolivia and took and helped to con construct a program of uh, eradication of coca that was voluntary, not voluntary, but that what they call community control, so that rather than US troops or uh, uh, US trained Bolivian troops violently eradicating coca crops, um, the Bolivian government has now developed a program without the US's help to uh, control coca production uh, per family uh, in the communities that grow coca. And it's been incredibly effective uh, so that um, uh, the local government and the local coca growers union controls that eradication. And so there's a much, there's, there's, um, you don't see the same level of violence that used to be present when the US was in charge of eradication. And, um, and so that was an, that was an amazing anti-imperialist move from Morales to do that. Um, he moved forward on a lot of land ref with a lot of land reform, coordinated with the country's vibrant social movements, and um, and uh, and worked with with these various leaders throughout the region. So while all of these governments were different during this time, um, they all sh shared a lot of 
the same values and principles and uh, vision. Many of them were against, uh, against U, uh, US, US imperialism, US military bases. Um, they wanted Latin America to break free of trade agreements such as NAFTA. Um, and they, uh, they emphasized regional cooperation to build multinational Latin American institutions that helped resolve diplomatic problems without the US meddling in the region's politics. For example, um, in 2008, there was a destabilization effort in Bolivia to over basically destabilize the country of Bolivia, uh, the government of Bolivia, uh, and, and that effort was led by right-wing groups in the eastern part of the country, and they were very violent in the streets and attacking indigenous people, and basically trying to foment a kind of civil war. And Evo Morales, uh, rather than uh, what would have been the norm in the past, calling upon Washington to help solve the situation, um, called Michelle Bachelet in Chile, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, Nestor Kirchner in Argentina, and they all worked together to try to solve this problem diplomatically as a region without the US getting involved. So those kind of um, problems, national and multinational within Latin America, were resolved by this new coalition of presidents, um, some through uh, UNASUR, which was acted as, as a kind of alternate, alternative to the Organization of American States, and uh, also through ALBA, the, um, the kind of uh, Venezuelan-led network of socialist governments that, that helped to create more economic and political independence in the region. So it was a really um, incredible time. Um, at the same time, uh, there, were, there were plenty of contradictions and problems under these governments. So not all the leaders listened to the social movements that helped them get elected in the first place. Some of them, uh, for example, Lula in Brazil, didn't always work that closely with the landless movement, and they were unhappy with the pace of land reform change in his country. Um, uh, Bachelet in Chile uh, cracked down on student protests for educational ref progressive educational reform. Uh, Moral Evo Morales in Bolivia sidelined indigenous critics that were uh, critical of his um, uh, pro-mining stance. So indigenous movements, indigenous communities would say, well, uh, we don't want this mine or these, these mining operations um, poisoning our land, poisoning our rivers. We want more input into where they go, how, they, or how they're operated, where, and uh, if they exist at all. And Morales has really silenced that aspect of the indigenous movement's uh, critics to say, we want to move forward with mining, with gas, the gas industry to generate more income to help with these poverty, elite, um, poverty relief programs. So, um, and then similarly, Rafael Correa, in spite of his progressive constitution in that country, said, we want to move forward with oil exploration program, uh, programs in the Ecuadorian Amazon in spite of our respect for nature. Um, aspect of our constitution. So those are some of the key um, points that uh, come, some of the points of discord and contradictions. Up to about 2012, uh, it was this kind of heyday, this really uh, incredible period, exciting period for socialism, so socialism, human rights, and leftist politics in the region. And then uh, roughly around 2012, 2013, this uh, shift was starting to turn toward the other direction, and a lot of these same countries now are under control of right-wing governments. So this happened in a number of different ways, um, and uh, I'm just going to go through a few different cases of where, where this has happened. So in Paraguay in 2012, Paraguay, uh, Lugo, the, the uh, liberation theologist and bishop in the country who was elected president, he was impeached in what many consider a parliamentary coup, where the opposition controlled parliament and they um, impeached him, uh, and, um, and they've taken power, and they're in power now. So the same type of oligarchy that has been in control of Paraguayan politics for many, many years is now back in power, and they remain in power. Um, they've they, and they've continued to implement conservative economic policies, criminalize protests, move forward with the destructive of uh, with the destructive soy industry. So soy in, um, the, the, the production of soy throughout Brazil, Argentina, um, Paraguay, a lot of it goes to feed 
farm animals in Europe or China. Um, and uh, it's just a mono, mono crop that covers a lot of the region now. And they're, um, they use very toxic pesticides, typically, and displace a lot of small farmers and poison the rivers, poison the land. And I visited a lot of these places, and the, the small farming communities are just up against a huge challenge. And, uh, and what the, now the Paraguayan government is moving ahead with that soy industry, and, and, and small farmers are really uh, suffering, for example, in Paraguay. Um, Chile's right-wing president, Sebastián Piñera, was re-elected in 2017. He was president from 2010 to 2014, but he's, he's now the president again, so the right has returned to power in Chile. Um, in Ecuador, uh, it hasn't been a, a rightward shift, but Correa stepped down from office, and uh, his party's uh, candidate, Lenin Morena, won last year, so he's still in power. But it has made, meant a shift for, away from Correa. Um, in, in Venezuela, probably one of the most dramatic examples of this, of the changes that have happened. Um, in 2013, Hugo Chavez died, uh, leaving behind Nicolas Maduro as president. And by this time, the drop in Venezuela's oil prices was so great that it really hurt the economy, which was so dependent on oil. Um, Right-wing destabilization efforts uh, really weakened the government's um, ability to to, to govern, um, at the same time, Nicolas Maduro has repressed a lot of dissidents, repressed a lot of the uh, opposition in the country. Um, opposition leader Capriles was denied from, was, was prevented from running for office for corruption charges. Um, the, um, at the same time, uh, Maduro has tried to meet this economic crisis by not bowing down to the IMF and the World Bank and, but instead, uh, creating um, neighborhood groups to help with the distribu distribution of basic food and commodities at low prices to help offset the problems of the economic crisis. Um, and, uh, and he's, um, and he's, and he's, he's working with, um, you know, working to continue the legacy of Hugo Chavez, but there's been so much conflict in the country the economic crisis is so great that um, a lot of the progress has been coming to a halt and there's been a lot of violence in the country um, through different political factions. Um, in Bolivia, uh, Evo Morales is planning to run for a fourth term next year. So kind of an interesting situation in the sense that he, he um, there was a referendum uh, last year that said, you know, where he said to the population, should I run again? Do you want me to run again? Can I change the constitution to run again uh, for a fourth term? The referendum said no. He's going ahead uh, and he went to the Supreme Court and asked them, you know, and he has appointed a lot of the judges on the, on the Supreme Court, and they reformed the uh, law and said it would be okay. So there's a lot of um, opposition to this plan in spite of Morales' popularity, a lot of people, even among his supporters, believe that it's time for a change to a different administration, a, different, a chance for different parties to uh, rise to the top, or different candidates in his party to rise to the top. But he's planning to move ahead, so that election will probably take place um, with Evo participating next year. And this is likely to be a source of a lot of conflict in the country. Um, at the same time in Bolivia, the GDP, the economy is very strong. GDP is growing, there's a lot of uh, stability in the country, uh, but again, there's, this sim there's a similar, as I mentioned, uh, a crackdown on dissent, a crackdown on critics that are critical of, of, his, of Evo Morales' party and also his, uh, his moving forward with massive mining and oil and gas industries that are um, displacing indigenous communities across the country. Um, in Argentina, the... Um, so there you had the, the Nestor Kirchner partnership that Nestor Kirchner and his wife Christina were, were in charge from roughly 2003 to 2017, or 2015, sorry. And um, uh, when the businessman Mauricio Macri won the elections. And this was the first time a right-wing president was democratically elected in the country in 100, nearly 100 years. Um, so he has moved back, he has rolled back a lot of the progressive economic and political policies that 
the Kirshner's instituted um, rolling back a lot of the social security and health care reforms, cutting pensions and assistance to poor families, raising taxes on the poor, lessening taxes for large corporations. Um, and he's pushing forward, opposite to Nestor Kirshner, pushing, pushing forward a free trade deal with the European Union, which is expected to hurt small businesses and the agricultural and industrial sector. Um, and moving forward with new labor policies that are meant to weaken unions and workers unions are protesting this move dramatically in the streets. There's a lot of um, union, unity between uh, sectors of the labor, labor unions that would typically be at odds with each other. So right now in Argentina there's a big showdown between the right wing government of Macri and the um, unions and protest movements against him, similar to 2001 uh, when people were rejecting similar type of policies uh, during that period. Um, in Brazil, in 2006, Dilma Rousseff, Lula's successor, was impeached um, because of corruption. Uh, and uh, the, but they were tried by, it was, it was again a, what some people consider a kind of parliamentary coup or a soft coup because right, these very corrupt right-wing politicians were going after Dilma Rousseff and ex-President and ex -President Lula to weaken the Workers' Party, weaken their, their leftist party and their hold on power. And, uh, and they, were, they were a part of, uh, Rousseff and, and Lula were a part of this corruption scandal. She was brought out of office. And, uh, and, but it was this situation where these, where these um, very corrupt pro politicians were leading this, these impeachment proceedings. And the Brazilian social scientist Buenaventura de Sousa Santos said, the impeccably honest politician in Brazil, the, the one impeccably honest politician in Brazil was being successfully impeached for corruption by the votes of all the most corrupt officials in the land. And that quote really sums up where Brazil is at right now, um, to the point where just last week, Lula, the very popular president, was just put in jail by this government um, of uh, Michel Temer. And um, he wasn't elected, he just assumed office and then called off, uh, and rejected to call early elections and just assumed office. Um, and there too, the, um, the landless movement, unions, and the base of the Workers' Party are mobilizing in the streets in huge protests to demand Lula's release. So though the region is going toward this leftist shift, there's a lot of resistance with social movements, protest movements, unions. Um, in Argentina, in Brazil, some of the most you know, economically and politically powerful countries in the region um, against this. So, some of the right uh, that is in power now have won through um, shady means, through parliamentary coups, um, shady impeachment processes. Some have won through electoral victories. Um, some have won through, um, uh, yeah, a coup like what happened in, um, in Paraguay. Uh, but I think that moving forward, there's, there's going to be a lot of resistance to these governments uh, through social movements, as well as the political parties as they reorganize themselves. But I think that one of the most hopeful aspects uh, looking forward in the region are, is the power of these social movements, these protest movements and unions that are working for um, a socialist, progressive direction in their country, more participatory, uh, greater respect for human rights. And I think that that's where a lot of the, uh, the hope lies in the region now over the next months and years going forward just as these movements transformed Latin America in the early 2000s at the turn of the century, I think they can do it again these days. So that's my, that's my thought. thanks. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Um, I find it hard to believe that I heard a lecture now on politics. Hmm? Hold the microphone. Uh, I'm saying that I find it hard to believe that I heard a long lecture now on South American politics without any mention of the CIA. <laughs> and uh, for instance, you know, in Bolivia, the, the Novo was uh, orchestrated by the CIA. 
and the, you know, the lack of fundia, mm -hmm. call it, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, all throughout Latin America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's uh, that's a great point. Um, uh, the CIA has been obviously very involved in um, in the region and helping right wing governments, helping right wing and helping helping the defeat of the left, and um, and and WikiLeaks has really helped uh, shed light on what the U.S. government has been doing secretly um, for through a lot of this period. WikiLeaks um, and other declassified documents that have come to light, so we can see more about what's gone on, uh, what the U.S. has been doing to undermine these countries. Um, it's very clear that in 2002 there was an attempted coup against Hugo Chavez that was very much backed by the U.S. government. Um, there was a uh, there was a declassified document that I remember reading that that uh, detailed that the um, U.S. government um, through USAID and the DEA um, and the embassy there uh, was working to undermine the Evo Mor the uh, the coca growers union and the MAS as a political. Um, as a political force in the country, and uh, and uh, they they literally said that because they, they they were afraid of the power that the Moss might have, and then Moss went on to win elections, and Evo Morales became the president. Um, and a lot of a lot of uh, the right wing groups in Bolivia have been supported by the um, National Endowment for Democracy, and. Uh, and the and USAID, so these different groups that are tied to Democrats, Republicans, you know, our, our, our own senators um, in Vermont, um, are doing some quite nefarious stuff throughout Latin America. And some of what the CIA used to do covertly, now groups like the NED and USAID are, do, are doing overtly to dis, uh, d directly fund um, opposition candidates, opposition uh, politicians, whether it's in Venezuela or um, or Bolivia, so that's a real, a real issue. Is that? Oh, we have a question uh, in the front here. Oh, oh I didn't see it. Uh, you've left out any mention of Colombia mm -hmm. and Peru. Mm -hmm. Are there any notable events happening in those countries? I would think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I met, uh, uh, let's see. So they weren't a part of the same kind of leftist shift. Um, they've, they've remained largely uh, the same with some notable exceptions. But um, in Peru, one of the things that has been um, most notable in terms of indigenous resistance to mining and gas is that, excuse me, Peru has such a huge amount of mineral wealth and there's been major bloody conflicts between indigenous communities in the Amazon, the northern part of Peru, um, and the and, uh, and mining companies uh, that have echoed the similar kind of things that have been happening throughout the Andes. But that's one of the things that um, happened even under Ollanta Humala, the uh, president, nominally progressive president of Peru, during that time. Um, and Colombia is a very important country in the region in terms of. Um, you, historically, in terms of U.S. Latin American relations, and uh, and historically because of the drug trade, so a lot of the U.S. Uh, drug control efforts have focused on Colombia, um, primarily in the the 80s onward, 70s onward, um, and through Plan Colombia, started by Clinton in the 90s, uh, for example, and um, a lot of the the um, the conflicts that used to be centered in Colombia around uh, violence related to drug production and narco trafficking have now dispersed throughout uh, Central America and Mexico. So uh, not just for cocaine, but other drug production and the trafficking of drugs from Colombia to the US. So that um, sadly a lot of the um, uh, a lot of that violence uh, has has hit um, linked to drug trafficking as well as the militarization and violence uh, that the states are unleashing on traffickers and related uh, gangs. And so the situation in Central America and Mexico is pretty catastrophic, uh, particularly over the last 15 years. Um, there's been 
just tens of thousands of deaths in Mexico alone linked to the drug war, uh, the wider drug war uh, of the government versus the narcos and inter-narco violence um, since about 2010. This is an unbelievable number of people who have been murdered, and that's extended throughout Central America with a breakdown in democratic structures and a lot of uh, various coups have happened in, um, well, Honduras being the most notable uh, coup uh, that happened against democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya. But in terms of Colombia, so that's been one part of what's been happening with the drug trade moving up uh, from south to north from Colombia. Um, but um, the, the, uh, the, the, tra the, the, the U.S.'s um, contr project of Plan Colombia has also been used, sadly, as a plan to control drug trafficking in Mexico as well, and so that's where a lot of um, U.S. funding and militarization efforts have focused through Plan Manida, which is supposed to mimic Plan Colombia. Um, but in terms of... Uh, um, in terms of the drug trade, a lot of the a lot of the conflicts in rural Colombia, as I understand them now, are less about the drug trade and more about um, palm oil, uh, you know, palm oil production, cattle ranching, land conflicts, uh, and um, and this kind of corporate takeover of rural land. That's less about the drug trade, but more about you know inserting corporate Colombia America. into yeah the global market. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and then there's also the huge news of the demobilization of the FARC, which happened, I think, last year or something like that. So that was a, but, um, but yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I have a question on this oh, yeah. side. Oh, sorry, yep. These changes that you've outlined, mm -hmm. are they really homegrown? Do any of the major powers have interests in South America, like Russia or China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, <coughs> great question. I think that there's always the, there's, let's see, so obviously during the Cold War, a lot of, there was a lot of support from the Soviet Union for places like Sandinista, Nicaragua, a lot of support for Cuba, so a lot of conflicts and tensions between Russia and the U.S. played themselves out in South America through uh, Cuba, Chile, um, Nicaragua. Um, but you know, with the fall of the Soviet Union, that's that's been uh, less of an issue in terms of uh, of a more communist solidarity, um, and and China China has been significant. Um, in a lot of ways, but I'll get to that in a second. But the, but I would say for the most part, these are quite homegrown developments. Um, the the rise of socialism in the 21st century Latin America is is quite um, quite homegrown, and it comes out of a tradition of socialist movements that probably are most directly linked to the struggles in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so a lot of these m movements from Venezuela to Argentina to Bolivia really talked about and, and reflected on um, those socialist struggles in previous decades. But whether you're talking about Hugo Chavez or, or Evo Morales or Nestor Kirchner, they're quite homegrown. At the same time, there's a really important shift that happened economically in the region where the US's influence has been on the wane economically uh, and trade-wise while China has moved in, and so tri China is one of the, the region's biggest trading partners right now. I think it is the, it's outpaced the U.S. in terms of trade. Um, and so that's, that's a major development, and it wasn't true 15 years ago. So um, that's been happening, and, um, and uh, the, let's see, yeah, but that would be, that would be my answer. Yeah, they were quite homegrown, and that, um, but they also represented a shifting political and economic landscape. But, they weren't um, totally tied to places like China and Russia, quite independent. Yep, back there again. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we'll, uh, maybe over here, just while they're figuring out the mic. Just heard a couple of days ago that while they were a bit enthralled with China, they've changed their mind more recently. Do you agree with that? Or? 
Um, let's see. So, um, was China it? was it getting a little too pushy in the area? Oh, perhaps. I'm not really sure. Um, uh, it probably depend on the country, but I don't know if that's news. I'd like to read it. I'd like to learn about that. Is there any good news coming out of South America right now? <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the gains of the of the, the first of the like 21st century socialism or the pink tide, whatever you want to call it, they can't be erased with one new president because an entire generation in a lot of countries um, went through went to the doctor for the first time or had uh, you know, life-changing eye surgery for the first time, or um, a new generation of people are capacitated in, in terms of getting new job skills, or are literate, um, healthy, uh, have land, have jobs, have homes that were provided for them through, this, through these governments. Um, and so that kind of change, I think, will last for a long time. And that was the, always the hope with a lot of these governments. Similarly, their constitutions, in Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, are new, reflecting these changes, and so they aren't going aw going away anytime soon. It will take a you know major reform, a major rewriting of the constitution for that to happen. So those changes are lasting, and I think, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of very exciting and inspiring power from the social movements in the region that are trying to fight for Lula's release, um, fight against mockery in Argentina. It's really incredible, uh, and I think that that's where a lot of uh, that's exciting, I think, yep. So we're going to try again. OK, great. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Ben. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, with, with all of these countries, both in South America, our own country, and also in Europe, with all these right-wing uh, governments being elected, um, have you had a chance recently to be in South America? And if so, what part? And what are South Americans asking you about our government? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's always interesting. I mean, I think I was in, yeah, I, I sometimes when I was in Bolivia, when I was in Latin America during the Bush years, I learned a lot about my own government from being outside the country, and especially about U.S. foreign policy and uh, role in different coups and dictatorships. So it was a big education that I didn't expect. And, um, and yeah, I think that there was a lot of, so I mean, I've traveled in Latin America pretty much every year since 2002, and last year was in Bolivia. I think that was the recent time, uh, most recent time. And um, yeah, and let's see, generally people were very excited about the Obama administration uh, and the hopes that it inspired. Um, and there were a lot of exceptions where his policies didn't actually work out that well, like Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State oversaw the coup in Honduras and Paraguay. Um, and, the, and the government, and the Obama administration turned a blind eye to the, the soft coup in Brazil. Um, you know, so there are a lot of clear signals uh, from the Obama administration throughout his time in power that the US government wasn't changing too much in its policies towards Latin America you know, from the Bush years on. But, um, but generally, people were very um, you know, glad that Bush was gone. And, and excited about Obama, and I don't think anybody anticipated that Trump could ever be president. <laughs> that ever, that ever, that who I ever uh, spoke with. And um, but uh, it's it's um, you know there's there's a there was always an understanding in various countries that I visited that I would anticipate people to be um, upset with me personally for being an American, but. Oftentimes, including many trips to Cuba, people would always say, oh, we understand that the, that the people of the U.S. are different from the government, um, and we don't hold any grudges against you in particular. Um, and, uh, but a lot of the critiques also centralized not so much on the White House or Washington, but whether it was with peasant, uh, small farmers in Paraguay or indigenous communities in, Briz in uh, Bolivia, they were against this kind of multinational system of corporate globalization of uh, companies like Bechtel coming into the country, um, uh, Monsanto and Archer Daniels Midland and uh, other you know, multinational, you know, huge food and pesticide companies um, in, in Paraguay. And they recognized that the US was a part of this kind of corporate globalization model. Um, and their targets were less, sometimes less Washington and more 
individual companies um, and their allies in their own nation's government. Hi. Um, what are the population trends in South America and uh, do they affect any of the rest or unrest or political situations? Um, yeah, I mean, they're, it's hard to say. I'm not really sure. I mean, it's growing. It's definitely a growing population. And it's, and one of the things, one of the places where it has the biggest effect are in major, you know, huge cities. Like um, Mexico City has you know, over three, 30 million people. Uh, Lima is, what, 10 million. Um, and uh, there has been a shift in terms of that, you know, rising population in urban areas a shift um, in recent years from rural campesino peasant movements uh, being a major force for change toward more urban uh, movements of, uh, of uh, people without home, you know, homeless people's movements, uh, tenant rights movements, students movements, so that, um, uh, so that, that's been a shift in a, in a kind of <coughs> toward a new epicenter of social change in Buenos Aires, in Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo, in um, Caracas, Mexico City, um, wh wh which has really a, a addressed the massive inequality that is so present in places where they're so densely populated. Does that make one, one answer? Yeah, Sandy. Can you comment on what you think is gonna happen in Venezuela? There are elections, right, next month? Or not? Um, I'm not sure if they've been, if they are. I been read somewhere that uh, President Trump has said that he would not recognize the elections in Venezuela, probably if Maduro oh. is reelected. Is that mm -hmm. have to um, happen? I haven't, I, had, I don't know about that recent update, um, but I do know that the Trump administration, like the Obama administration, has been very uh, much against Maduro and against Hugo Chavez, uh, pre you know, previously when Ch Chavez was alive. And it's a really difficult situation in the sense that um, a lot of pressure is coming from Washington, from the Organization of American States, essentially for regime change in Venezuela. And I've, um, I am of the opinion that anything where the U.S. is meddling in another country's affairs is a bad, is a bad idea, especially in the case of Latin America under a Trump presidency in Venezuela. Um, I think the only bad things could happen. And, and, the, and um, so while there, there's this major crisis in Venezuela, there, there's a, you know, a centralization of power, authoritarian strains in the government as there were under Chavez as well, um, and violence in the streets, which, which both sides are um, implicated in. Um, I think that it's up to, you know, the US should respect the sovereignty, the self-determination of the country and not intervene. But it's it's hard. It's I wouldn't expect too many good things to come from the Trump administration. But things are also changing so quickly that for me at least it's been hard to follow exactly what's developing. And I know that that Maduro also had canceled previous elections, and then and, you know put the, not canceled them but postponed them, which raised some red flags um, in terms of his commitments to democracy. But it's a it's a very complicated situation. I would recommend this web a website for Venezuela called VenezuelaAnalysis.com which is a great place to follow this really complicated situation there. Okay, great, well thank you very much.